He called me from that appointment and said, I thought the techs put up the wrong x-ray for me. I thought it was the original one from after his surgery and I had to double check that it was a correct x-ray because it was gone. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. Today on Dog Cancer Answers, we have a special kind of episode to bring to you, a conversation with Tara, who is the loving dog mom to Dunbar, who is sort of a cancer survivor miracle dog with a great true tale to share with you. And Dunbar's veterinarian, Dr. Katie Berlin, is also joining us to talk a little bit about her perspective on this really, truly amazing true tale. Dr. Katie Berlin, Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This is so much fun. I'm so looking forward to this. Yeah, Tara, you've been sort of a a model Dog Cancer Answers listener for a long time, because I know you have a long and wonderful story to tell. And you've got your veterinarian, Dr. Katie Berlin, who's told part of the story before in a previous episode. And we'll put a link in the show notes so everybody can listen to that from her perspective. And so I'm just excited to hear the latest on Dunbar. But first, let's hear a little bit about Dunbar, when Dunbar was diagnosed with cancer, what it was, when it was, what happened, and what's it gone on. Well, um, Dunbar seemed fine. You know, he's getting a little older. He's 12 now, but uh, he was getting a little older, but no issues, nothing going on with him, doing really well. And he woke me up at 3 a.m., coughing blood in my face, (gasps) October 18th of 2019. I was a vet tech for 15 years, so I knew this was not a good thing. I know lung cancer, primary lung cancer is not a good thing. It's not in humans either, but it's not in our pets. So it stopped. It was just that one time. And that's what you assumed it was, Tara? You assumed right right away, then at 3 in the morning, this is lung cancer. That's why I have a face full of blood. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he stopped. Stop coughing, stop bleeding, acting completely fine. So I waited till the regular vet office opened, took him in. They did imaging. There was an obvious something there. Sent it out for diagnostics, did a follow-up. I think we had him on antibiotics for a little while, did a follow-up. And that was with Dr. Berlin when we did the follow-up. I pretty much knew that it wasn't going to be good news, but had that glimmer of hope because when it went out to the radiologist, they weren't 100% sure that it was a mass. So, you know, there's that glimmer, but I I kind of knew better and was preparing for the worst at that point. What else could it have been other than a mass in the lungs? Even the the one specialist, when we started going down to the specialist, uh, the ultrasound specialist said it could have been something they inhaled, It could have been infection or um, possibly um, fungal infection as well. Oh, okay. So those were kind of the the far out possibilities. Right. But it looked like a mass, like a tumor. It wasn't like diffuse where you would see maybe an infection was all over the place. It was really concentrated. Yeah. That must have been so scary. Yeah. The kind of thing you just, you do not want to see on on a radiograph on one of your favorite dogs ever. Mm. Why was he... One of your favorite dogs? Oh my gosh, Dunbar is just like, like Dunbar is just the the man. I mean, he is he's like a brown dog, you know. He's like kind of a medium sized dog, and he's brown, and he just comes in and he owns the entire vet clinic uh-huh. when he comes in. Like everybody's there to see him. He's the mayor. Everybody, whatever you're doing is like less important. He's, he's like holding court wherever he goes. Yeah. Like, yep. Like, we have multiple pictures of him just, like, plopping down on someone's lap in the middle of the treatment area, you know, or the or the phone room. Like, he just is a love machine, and he's very demanding about wanting his attention and his treats, and he's a lap sitter. And there's just something about him. You know, you, know, you meet those animals that you just, they're like your bud right away. And he was just, I just felt like we were buds right away. And he's buds with everyone, so I can't feel that flattered by that. But it was really, he always made my whole day to see him. And he came with Tara, (laughs) which was definitely a a big bonus because, you know, we have pets that we love that come with people that are a little bit maybe less of a connection. And then 
you have people that you love and the animals don't really want to have anything to do with you. But seeing that family come in together, like you and Chuck and Dunbar and all of your other animals, like you just, just brighten the place up. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so you send the radiographs off and I'm remembering, Katie, there's a part of the story where you had to sort of hurry those up. Am I misremembering? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, actually, I think you're right. I think I might have um, said, I know you've shut the whole thing down, but a small gasket. <laughs> you have to send these tonight. This is Dunbar. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we were, you were the last appointment of the day, maybe. And um, we had taken the radiographs and, you know, you get that like twisted knot in your stomach when you see them and you just know that it's not good. And did we really need a radiologist to tell us absolutely at that point? Like, probably not, but there's no way that any of us is going to make this call, you know, for this patient and this family, because you just want to do what's best and we want to be giving you right the right information. And so I wanted a radiologist to look at those and you agreed. It was the evening and I think the technicians had shut down the x-ray unit um, and the computer <laughs> that goes with it. And I believe that I had suggested strongly that that was not something that could wait until tomorrow. <laughs> um, and I I admit I probably didn't say that as diplomatically as I could have because I was really anxious, you know, and I did not want us to have to wait another 12 hours to get mm -hmm. those back. So when you got them back, it was cancer, it was lung cancer. Yeah. I mean, they can't, you know, diagnose definitively on a, on a radiograph image, mm -hmm. but it was in exactly the same place as it was in the previous images. And um, antibiotics and time had not done anything to change it. And that mm -hmm. that was a bad thing. And one thing, you know, you had mentioned, Tara, that it could be a fungal infection. And there are certain places in the country where that's going to be a lot more likely. Pennsylvania is not one of them. We just don't see that many lung infections caused by fungal disease. I've seen, I think, one, and it was actually nasal passages of a very young dog. And that was a super unusual case. That was a really weird case. But it's just not something that we see a lot of. And typically when we do see it, it looks more like a diffuse pattern, like lymphoma, like lymphoma tends to, and not just one solid mass, but it was pretty unlikely in our area. Where would you be more likely to suspect a fungal infection? Just what areas of the country? I mean, it just depends. In the South, definitely some areas around certain bodies of water. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge expert in that because I've never lived in one of those areas. Okay. So I've never actually seen a high incidence, but it's always on the list. If you have weird looking lung stuff, it's always on the list. And we're always asking if the dog traveled, you know, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But it was unlikely in Dunbar's case. So everything else was ruled out. So the most likely thing was, yeah. So what happened next? He went to a specialty hospital. We went down, they did an ultrasound. That's where, again, the doctor said, oh, it could possibly be something that he inhaled, but we're going to set up a CT. And we did a consult with that surgeon, and she said, it's highly unlikely that it's something that he inhaled. She said, if we lived, I think, California or something, I think that was the state, I can't remember, maybe, but not the way it's presenting, not the way it looks. You know, she really didn't feel that way. She thought that it was removable, resectable through his ribs without cutting into his rib cage, but wasn't sure she'd know what the CT we scheduled the CT with the surgery after, you know, if it was able to come between his ribs, we were willing to do that surgery because he was so healthy otherwise. And we have pet insurance, you know. Uh, I, what pet insurance? I know our listeners are going to want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Which pet insurance? Did you say? Yeah. Is it okay to say? Which company? Um, we, I've had yeah. pet plans since 2010. They're now Fetch. Okay. They've been around. Because they've been around, you'll see reviews. Oh, I hate them because my premium goes up every year. Well, your pet's aging, it does, and it does with all of the pet insurances. I have had no problems with claims. You know, you give them what they ask for, and I don't even have to submit extra. They were a lifesaver in this case because it took money out of the equation. It kind of took his age out of the equation because with the cost, the CT and the surgery total came out to $7,000. That's a lot for an eight-year-old dog with suspected primary lung cancer that you know the prognosis probably isn't going to be good. So it kind of took the money out of the equation. We didn't really have to worry so much about that aspect of things. 
That's really, really wonderful. And the reason I say it's okay is not necessarily to, you know, plug one company over another, but there's the concept of health insurance. So few Americans insure their pets, but I've heard so many times these stories about how people can do things because they don't have to worry about the finances because they know it's going to be covered or things are going to be covered that they don't have to worry about so they can have their finances go towards something that maybe isn't covered. It just helps to eliminate that from your calculations in such a heavy way that yeah. really gets in the way of a lot of people caring for their dogs, not just with cancer, but with lots of other illnesses. So it was covered. Yes. How wonderful. So you got the CT yep. and the surgery. And the surgery and the same day. He stayed there two nights, came home. We saw the oncologist after. So the pathology report came back and that really wasn't good. It was a primary undifferentiated pulmonary carcinoma with lymph node involvement. Oh, so it had already spread. The lymph node was attached to his aorta, so they couldn't remove it. That was the other problem. Oh. So he had a two to three month prognosis without chemo, six months with. Quality of life has always been the factor with every move we've made with him. And chemo, we said, let's just try it again. We've got the pet insurance. It was $350 a dose. He had to do one a week for four weeks, and then it got stretched out one a month or something. But again, the pet insurance covers that. So let's try it, see if he gets sick or not. Doses, you know, I, I know you've talked about it on podcasts as well. Dogs tend to react differently to chemo than humans. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have guessed that he was going through any chemo at all. He had zero side effects to that chemo. We started that. We did that for the extent. And then his x-rays, you know, had been clear for quite a while after that chemo. So the surgery got most of the tumor out, it sounds like. All of it. Yep. They removed the entire lobe. All of it. Yeah. All of it except that lymph node. That's great. And then the chemo is cleaning up the metastasis, and it was clear. Yeah. Wow. Until January of uh, 2021. <laughs> okay. So that's how many months later? Just over a year? Oh, that was over a year after his surgery and over a year mm -hmm. after his diagnosis. So he already was six months past his max diagnosis at that point. They saw something on his staging x-rays again. Mm. So we started a different chemo, went back, x-rays again didn't work. It actually grew. So then we started Palladia and it disappeared. It disappeared so much that when um, the oncologist called me, because of course we're COVID restrictions can't go in at that time. So this was, uh, this was, that made it a little even more scary. Um, we were kind of lucky that we got to go in before COVID and meet the oncologist and meet everybody. That made it a little less scary. But he called me from that appointment and said, I thought the techs put up the wrong x-ray for me. I thought it was the original one from after his <laughs> surgery, and I had to double check that it was a correct x-ray because it was gone. We never expected that. How long was he on Palladium? At that point, three months, maybe. Okay. It was his first restaging x-rays from starting Palladia, so I want to say three months. And he's been on Palladia ever since. Um, in between there. And he tolerates it well. Yeah, he does. Once in a while, he'll have some diarrhea, and we have to do a 10-day stop and then start over again, and he's pretty good. In between there, okay. when the mass had come back, I did do a phone consult with Dr. Dressler to tweak some things to see if there were any supplements I was overlooking, anything else he recommended. So we did do a phone consult there and, and tweak some things. But other than that, that was it. The Palladia, for some reason, is working for him, even though our oncologist you know, said it's kind of a, a last-ditch thing. It's a let's see if it works kind of thing. It's not labeled for primary lung cancer. Right. So you mentioned supplements. So what else have you been doing with Denbar since? I have a whole list. <laughs> and when did you start? <laughs> um, right? He's been... <laughs> you embrace the full spectrum approach? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And he goes for acupuncture every three weeks as well. So ah. insurance covers that. My word. They cover any supplements I get from a veterinarian or from his integrative vet. They don't cover anything I get over the counter. So... Over the counter. Okay. His um, cordyceps, turkey tail, those things I pay for out of pocket. Mm-hmm. Apocaps, 
he takes as well, I pay for them out of pocket. Um, none of our vets around here carry them. So that's where insurance has come in as well because it's covering the other things so it frees up that little bit of extra money for me for these supplements. After I talked to Dr. Dressler, we added in um, Tromiel, which is a natural and inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And we added in um, car carcinosinum. I, I can't pronounce it. Um, it's a homeopathic. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll figure out what that is. And he said that's just to try. You know, homeopathic stuff is, we don't know. So we threw that in there as well. He's been on the dog cancer diet this whole time. Okay. He has a veterinary quality fish oil supplement that he's been on this whole time as well. Everpup, canine immunity is his other one. So he gets the litany. I split them up. He tolerates them well. I know sometimes they can have some tummy issues, but he tolerates everything well. And we're lucky. <laughs> it's wonderful. You're lucky and you've also done about as much for him as as anybody, any dog could ask for, I think. You've had his best interests in mind, like you said. His quality of life has been at the forefront of everything you've done. And I know that there are people listening who will say, like, I don't know if I would have done that first surgery, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. taking out a lung lobe is a big deal. And I just want to tell you, like, I saw Dunbar after that surgery. Like the biggest problem he had was one of his stitches was sticking out and like the huge incision that he had was like in, it, he had to stretch his skin again to have full range of motion on that side of his body. But he did not miss a beat, man. That dog is he looks like the healthiest dog in the clinic when he's there. And his nose is a little grayer than it was when we started all this, but he he looks absolutely happy. In fact, I think for a while he was getting a little chubby and you had to put him on yes. a little bit of a yes. diet. <laughs> um, and he just, like, he has not missed a beat and he has not ever had a look on his face that I've ever seen that said, I don't feel well. I feel sorry for myself. Like, why is this happening to me? He just, you know, he has a love for you and a love for life and that I did never saw that stop for one second. And I think if it had, you would have chosen a different path for him. And so he's taught me lessons in, you know, sort of seeing the best in the situation and saying, you know what, this is what's going on and I'm going to deal with it the way that I always do, which is to take it in stride and love my people. And um, he's lucky and you're lucky, but you guys have also done a lot to make that luck together. That's a good place for us to stop and take a quick break and listen to some of our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to hear Dr. Katie Berlin, if you'd share with us a little bit about what you think about whether attitude has a role in treating dog cancer. Every meal you give your dog is an opportunity to support vibrant health and even fight cancer. The Dog Cancer Diet is a set of guidelines that Dr. Dressler created for his book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide. And every ingredient is either supporting the body with dense nutrition or helping your dog's cells to fight cancer. And in some cases, both. You can help your dog at every meal. Even if you can't do a home-cooked diet, using just elements from the diet is a great way to help your dog every day. Is diet the only way to treat dog cancer? Of course not. Dr. Damian Dressler and Dr. Susan Ettinger, also known as Dr. Sue Cancer Vet, talk a lot about treatments in their best-selling book. Diet is just one of five important steps to take when you're planning your dog's cancer treatment. Check out the diet tips and the rest of the steps in what readers call the Bible of Dog Cancer, the Dog Cancer Survival Guide. You can find it wherever you find fine books or at dogcancerbook.com. And we're back with Tara, whose wonderful dog Dunbar has an amazing true tale, and Dr. Katie Berlin, who is Dunbar's vet. And Dr. Berlin, I wanted you to just weigh in a little bit with your experience. Does the attitude of the dog and the owner come into play when it comes to treating dog cancer? Yes, I think that's a short answer. Yes, it definitely does. Can the attitude of the dog and the family turn a case that would have ended badly into a case that ended miraculously or that's been 
been at least turning out miraculously. I don't know. It's funny the the way that the timing worked out because I think I met you, Molly and Jim, about the time that Dunbar was diagnosed because I talked about him when I met you. And so he's really been a part of the conversations that we've had together almost every time we've talked. And I was reading Dog Cancer Survival Guide at that time and because of meeting you. And um, so that was something that Tara and I could sort of bond over and talk about. And uh, it was all just like a strange confluence of events at that time. And then, you know, that he just kept coming up and then... I was also starting to do acupuncture at that time and learning about, Mm -hmm. you know, the ways that maybe the medicine that we're taught in vet school, it's not to say that I don't really believe in alternative treatments. I believe in treatments that work and don't work. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes there are treatments that don't work that we aren't taught about. And that doesn't mean that they're not legitimate. It just means that they're not in the curriculum that we're handed. And it seems a little bit like magic Mm -hmm. when those things work because we haven't learned about them in the traditional sense. And so I was starting to feel like there were just some, you know, there was just kind of a little bit of magic going on in the background when Dunbar and his family were dealing with all of this. And um, do I really believe in magic? Not really, I don't think. But do I believe that there are things going on that we don't have all the answers to? Yes. And I think in Dunbar's case, that's got to be the truth. You know, Mm -hmm. you have what you said is a kind of a perfect package of this amazing dog who has this thirst for life and just a love for his life. And you have a family who was always meant to be with him because Dunbar had it a little bit rough at the beginning. He's been through a lot of stuff before this. Mm. Like he has survived like a list of weird things. And yeah. Um, <laughs> well, really? Like what? <laughs> uh, Tara, do you want to take that part? <laughs> sure. <laughs> he came from South Carolina. They pulled him. He was on death row first of all. So a rescue by me in Northeast Pennsylvania pulled him because he was such a sweetheart, had to treat him for heartworm. He had tested negative. They agreed to pull him. Then they went to neuter him, retested him, he tested positive. So he had to be treated for heartworm. Oh my God. Then he started having just, he wasn't feeling well and um, was drinking more, urinating more. It happened all of a sudden. So he tested negative for all tick-borne illnesses multiple times, plus vaccinated for Lyme. You know, what the heck is this? Responding to doxycycline like a tick-borne illness, but it would come back. Finally went to a specialist that had a different tick panel run at a university that ran for Babesia two or three different tests. And he came up positive for two strains of Babesia. So we had to treat for Babesia which makes sense why it was responding to the doxycycline because it's tick-borne, but he needed a different, he actually had to have two different antibiotics to treat that. So yeah, he's been through quite a bit. And when he first got sick, his uh, urine protein creat ratio was almost like not compatible with life. It was so bad. So he's been through a very, very lot. He's amazing. Surviving heartworm is an accomplishment in and of itself, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and you said he was negative, so they agreed to pull him. So if he'd tested positive at the shelter initially, he probably wouldn't even have made it to you. Yep. Which is just cra- Like, this is like the death-defying dog, right? So, yeah. I mean, and then he has this family who has pet insurance, and they have other animals that they love. And they're just, you know, you and Chuck just, you had a philosophy of life that just gelled really well with him and with what he needed. And, you know, and you were open to tinkering with his diet and doing supplements. And I don't know if that made any difference, but all I know is if I get cancer, I want that diet and those supplements because he has no business (laughs) doing as well as he is. And for all this time and on drugs that aren't even made for his disease. And, you know, I, he really is a miracle dog and um, I am not a religious person in any way. And yet, you know, he's the kind of case that makes me understand why people do have faith because he has defied all the odds and nobody can really explain it, including Dr. Clifford, his oncologist, who is an amazing person and is the first one to say, you know, like he's done better than he ever expected. Incredible. Yeah. Because here we are 
more than two and a half years post-diagnosis. He'll be three years post in November. My word, with a primary lung tumor. Yes. Yeah, that with a lymph node that couldn't be taken out. I mean, there's that's just, yeah. you don't hear about people surviving that. Right. And I love it because I ran the social media for the vet hospital. I, I'm not there anymore. I moved away and I'm, have a remote job now. And I ran the social media and Tara was like the only one that knew that I was running it because she could message me at that <laughs> at that Facebook account. And so I'd get these messages saying, John Bar's ready <laughs> quest for queer, you know, yay. And then we'd just say, yay. It's be like Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and it just made my whole day that that was you know, that he was doing so well. And I, I just love getting those messages now. You know, you you guys really have had quite a journey. Yeah. So we're recording this in early July, 2022. Dunbar is still like happy and living his best life. And how often do you go in for checks at this point? Like what what is your sort of day to month to quarterly life look like with Dunbar? It's, he goes in every three months now. Mm -hmm. It was every six weeks. He would get blood work the one visit and then blood work and radiographs the next. Mm -hmm. Now they do it together because he has been holding steady for so long. You know, and every time we go, Dr. Clifford says, it's, you know, it's been this long now. It's been this long now. And <laughs> every day's a gift. And yep, it is. It absolutely is. I used to get nervous. I'll admit I was a little nervous about even submitting this story for this podcast because I was like, what if his next scan's bad? What if, what if? And you can't think that way. It's live in the moment. He lives in the moment. He doesn't think he's sick. He's happy, go lucky, running around. And so I've tried to embrace that as well myself. So I think a lot of people whose dogs go through cancer and they pay as close attention as you're paying attention to Dunbar have that experience. I've seen that and heard that a lot where people say, my dog taught me something in all of this. Yeah. Yep. I think he taught our whole vet team too. You know, I do think we see so many sad cases and cases where everybody seemed to do everything right and they didn't work out that well, you know, because disease is bad. Bad things happen to good dogs and good people. And um, it's easy to get to the point where you just don't really want to recommend it anymore. You don't want to encourage people to go to the oncologist. You don't want to encourage them to spend the money or the time or put that emotional energy into hoping that it's going to work. But a case like Dunbar's, and I've had a handful of cases that I would never forget my whole life because if your dog could be the one that comes out of it like Dunbar. It's worth making the recommendation, having the conversation because dog people want to know, you know, they want to know if there's even a chance and then make that decision for themselves and um, success stories, you know, stories where the hope paid off. We have to remember those as much as we remember the sad ones. Agreed. I'm wondering what Dunbar's favorite things to do are. Does he like... For example, does he have any water sports he enjoys, Tara? <laughs> well, we've got the dock jumping and he's retired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was never a big jumper to begin with. He was afraid of water. Because you own a dock jumping company. You have a... Yes. Yes, we run a dock jumping pool and uh, he was afraid of water. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. <laughs> he just would kind of plop off the dock for me. <laughs> But he, he last jumped in 2020. It was after his surgery and everything. He was still, but his jumps, when I say a jump, his personal best is six foot three inches, you know, to the base of his tail. Um, <laughs> he was jumping two feet, nine inches that season. So he just would jump because I asked him to. So I retired him. You know, he goes in to cool off when he's there for the day. That's about it. <laughs> he's naturally gifted in other ways. <laughs> oh, obviously. Yes. 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 He's clearly above average in all ways. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. He is our um, welcome team. You know, mm -hmm. when you come to the dock, he's the welcome dog. He loves everybody. He loves people. You know, that's his thing. He probably would have been a good therapy dog if I would have had the time and, and energy to be able to go that route because he does. He loves people. He has that patience. He will sit with you forever if you'll let him. So he's a therapy dog for Shiloh Veterinary <laughs> Hospital anyway. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, Tara, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story about Dunbar. 
I know that this kind of story is an important one, and it might seem weird that I ask about all of the details, but I know that's what people really want to know because they want to they want to compare it to their own experience. Yeah. So I just really appreciate you taking the time and the emotional energy. I know it's not easy to talk about these things, you know, when you're going through it because it's still very present to you. So I'm just wondering, is there any last word that you want to tell our listeners? Any last thing that you want to say? You know, never give up hope. There's, there's always something there. Bare minimum, with everything we've done for Dunbar, I felt like I was doing something. Mm -hmm. And that makes a huge difference, just feeling like you're doing something. Even if maybe it doesn't make as big of a difference as everything we did with Dunbar did, just knowing that you're doing something, you know, changing his diet, adding some supplements, just those little things were enough to make me feel better. Like I wasn't, it wasn't such an out of control situation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Katie Berlin, is there anything? Well, I mean, I, I have a picture of Dunbar sitting over my right shoulder here um, that it's back on the uh, oh, on the bookshelf there. I see it on the bookshelf. It's a goodbye gift <laughs> from Dunbar. Of course. Dunbar gives <laughs> gifts. Yeah. Tara just carried it to the office. Of course. <laughs> right. And I feel like that's what I want to say is that, you know, aside from what I just said, which is that you know, veterinary teams, like we need to feel the hope too from cases where we know that the prognosis isn't good, but that doesn't mean it's time to give up. Mm -hmm. But also just in terms of the relationship that we've had, like I give very few clients my personal information, you know, to, to share because you just never know, you know, the boundary gets really blurry sometimes and we all need to have time off. But the relationship that we've had, it helped me during times when I was feeling burned out or I felt like I wasn't making a difference. And I, to be honest, rarely made a difference for Dunbar. Like I was in the office to like snuggle him, like scratch his butt while he sat on me and like, you know, smush him and stuff. And that was like the best, the best days ever. But quite honestly, like all of the hard work in Dunbar's cases were done by other veterinarians. <laughs> like I basically <laughs> just got to reap the benefits of our relationship. And I know Tara will say no. And that's, that's why I love them because they understand that the relationship is what sustains us. Like mm -hmm. I kept coming to work because of clients like them and patients like Dunbar, even when I, like during the worst of the pandemic, I just wanted to stay home and I just didn't feel like I was connecting with people the same way because those relationships are what I think carry veterinarians and veterinary teams through the tough times. And I want the dog people listening to know that is that we take it home with us, even if we don't give you our cell phone number. And we have the pictures that you give us on our desks at home. I have like three more on my desk over here. And we think about you when we're not with you. <laughs> and I just would want you to know that we care that much. And this is, you know, Dunbar and Tara are just a really good example of how deep that caring can go. Because I, I, I cried when he got diagnosed and I still tear up every time I get a message saying he's doing well. Well, I'm sure that there will be many, many, many people who are interested in hearing updates. So I hope that we'll have you back at some time to talk more about Dunbar and maybe get a little update, even if it's just for five minutes. Sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Tara. Thank you. And Dunbar, of course, <laughs> who I know is present. He is. <laughs> you better give him a big kiss for me. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> yeah, give him a snuggle from all of us. Mm -hmm. I will. I will. <laughs> And Dr. Katie Berlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you, listener, for being here with us today. I really admire Tara's willingness to sort of do the thing that she can do. At every step of the way, she was saying, okay, what can I do right now that will help and not hurt? And then she chose that. And that's really the key, right? Like, we don't want to do things that will get in the way of treatment. But when we can take a step like changing the diet, adding a supplement, driving that extra hour to go to the oncologist who's open on Saturday, then it makes us feel like we're there to support our dog. And that in itself, I think is therapeutic for the dog and the human to have that bond. I hope that you've taken some hope and inspiration from Dunbar's story. I know that 
he would want you to based on what we've heard about him today. And if you have a true tale that you'd like to share with listeners of Dog Cancer Answers, go ahead and give us a call. Our listener line is 808-868-3200. Leave some words on there about your dog and their true tale. And we'd love to have you come on the show. If you have a question of any kind for our veterinarians, go ahead and leave that there as well. Don't forget to follow us on all the socials. Join our Facebook group, Dog Cancer Support. You can search for it on Facebook or go to dogcancersupport.com. And make sure you subscribe to Dog Cancer Answers in your podcast app of choice because that's the best way to hear about new episodes as they come out. I'm Molly Jacobson from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network. I'm wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.